Hi, I'm Gareth Green and in this video we're going to investigate why it is that harmonizing a chromatic scale is not something impossible. Now why do I put it that way? Because lots of people struggle to harmonize a chromatic scale. Most people once they've found their way around their diatonic chords can harmonize a major scale and then in the fullness of time can get their heads around harmonizing a minor scale. You know if I harmonize the scale of C major well I can kind of go one, five, one, four, maybe one B for a change. How about two, seven for a change, five, seven, one. In other words, you can use the diatonic chords within the scale and as long as the melody note of the scale fits the chord that you've chosen, you can't go too far wrong. So when you harmonize a chromatic scale, life is immediately more complicated because which key are you in? And chords always have a kind of key reference to them, don't they? That you have a kind of function because you're going from five to one or something. When you're doing, using a chromatic scale, you can't really allow chords to function in that way or chords just simply don't function in that way. So you've got to take a different approach to it. And there are lots of different ways in which you can harmonize a chromatic scale. But in this video, I'm going to focus on one possible way of doing it. Now, you might say at this point, well, I'm sure that's all very interesting, but I never need to harmonize a chromatic scale. So what use is this to me? Well, the point is, you might not need to harmonize a whole chromatic scale, or you might actually say, well, nevertheless, there are chromatic passages that I come across in a melody. So for example, you might be in C major, and then every now and again, your melody might go C, C sharp, D. So you've got three notes that are chromatic, and you're sort of thinking, oh, now, how can I deal with that? In a way, even those situations are slightly easier than harmonizing a complete chromatic scale. If you're in C major and the melody goes C, C sharp, D, well, you could say I could use a secondary dominant in D minor. In other words, maybe I use a tonic chord of C major for that first note C. When I come to C sharp, I use five, seven in the key of D minor one in the key of D minor to follow for that D. The point being that this is one in D minor, but it's also chord two in C major. So from there you can carry on in C major quite happily. When we're going on, maybe we've got a more extended chromatic passage. The more chromatic writing that you've got that needs harmonizing, the more complicated it gets. Well, there are certain situations where you might have a chromatic passage in which you don't have to harmonize every single note. You might be in C major, you might have a chromatic passage that goes one, two, three, four, five from C to E using the first five notes of a chromatic scale. And you could say, well, actually, the C sharp is just some kind of chromatic passing note and so is the D sharp. So I could just put down a chord of C major and have a melody that goes up the chromatic scale. So I've got a harmony note or a chord tone with the C and with the E. In between I'm using these chromatic passing notes to get me there. So you could do that. You could use a chord of A minor on the basis that C and E both belong to that chord too, so chord six in C major. So there are ways around this. If you're thinking, I've just got maybe three notes of a chromatic scale, often secondary dominant will work well for you. If you've got a few more notes, but actually it's just a melodic decoration, well, then you can often locate a chord that can incorporate the melodic decoration as chromatic passing notes. But what do you do faced with the challenge of harmonizing the whole scale? Something you may just want to do, and I've certainly had this situation working with singers over the years when they want to do warm-ups singing chromatic scales. Well, can you just sit at the keyboard and harmonize the chromatic scale for them? 
that sort of thing is quite useful to be able to do if you work in those kind of contexts. But you might also find it quite interesting just to see one way of harmonizing the whole chromatic scale so that you can think, ah, if I just had those three notes of a chromatic scale and I did actually want a chord for each of the notes, well, actually, you know, what are the possibilities? So in other words, you could lift two or three chords out of each corner of this chromatic scale harmonization that I'm about to explain. Okay, well, let's get into this then. So you can see what I've got at the top here. I've just put all the notes of a chromatic scale running from C to C. Doesn't really matter which notes we start on, but it's a complete chromatic scale going up an octave. Okay, well, it's in C as a starting point. So I'm starting on a C major chord and I'm finishing on a C major chord. So there's a kind of C major reference to this. But let's see what I'm doing. Here's the C at the beginning with a C major chord. Now then, I could just go secondary dominant into D minor. That's a perfectly reasonable thing to do, as I've just explained. But just going to give you a more colourful option. And I'm going to use some chords that you probably know something about, but some of them I'm going to use in a functional way and some of them I'm purposely using in a non-functional way so you can kind of think, ah, okay, what works for me out of that little lot? So we've dealt with the first chord, so we can take that one off. What about the second chord then? What I'm going to do here is use a diminished seventh. You see, diminished sevenths are really useful chords, actually. You could, if you so wished, go up the whole scale in diminished sevenths. You see how that works? It's kind of quite effective. The great thing about diminished sevenths is there are so many different ways in which they might resolve depending on the N harmonics. You know, are we using a C sharp or a D flat? Well, a diminished seventh might go in a different direction. If it's got a C sharp, then the direction it might take if it's got a D flat. So that's another topic. But diminished seventh chords are very flexible. And one thing you might consider, if you're in a chromatic passage and you've no idea what to put down for the next chord, a diminished seventh is often a useful kind of let out clause. Um, I've used another one during the course of this scale, but I'm trying to do different things to show you different possibilities within the scale. But there we are, C major, straight on to a diminished seventh. One thing I'm also trying to think about is kind of voice leading issues. You can see that I'm trying to write a bass line that's sort of going down by step, and then we kind of go up the octave, go by and by step, and I've just purposely put in a bit of a leap on the approach to the final cadence just to give the bass a little bit more interest. So I'm purposely using the diminished seventh here in this inversion so that I can get a bass line that's going down by step. Now, what about this next chord? I've chosen to put a D7 chord in. Now you might look at that and think, what? How does that work? Is that really a legitimate resolution of the previous diminished seventh. Well, you know, it's not illegitimate, let's put it that way, because this could easily go to a D major chord. That would be a great resolution of that diminished seventh. So if I make it a D7, well, I'm going to the D major chord, but I'm just putting a C natural in there. Now, okay, that's a dominant seventh in the key of G really, isn't it? But I'm not using it in a functional way. Okay, so we've got rules that normally apply to the resolution of a dominant seventh, like the seventh falls by step, the third rises by step, all that stuff. So you might expect that to resolve to a G major chord in more conventional uh, kind of context. Because we're going chromatically, I can use that D7 chord and then I'm going to modify it. Now see what I'm doing here on the next chord. So when I come to this chord and I've got D sharp in my chromatic scale. One thing I've tried to do is to use this F sharp as a common note, use this C as a common note, and then the outer parts just move out by a semitone. So D goes to D sharp at the top, A goes to A flat at the bottom. So I'm minimizing the movement, I'm keeping some contra motion going between the top and the bottom, but it's a way of taking a D7 and transforming it to this. 
And so what we end up with at that point is a German six. Well, as it turns out, <coughs> you can regard that as a German six in the key of C, um, but that's not the main point really, but it's quite interesting to hear this progression from a D seven to this German six. It's quite a colorful way of doing things. And if you hear that sound, you might think, oh, I've heard that before. You will have heard that kind of sound in late romantic music. So it goes quite nicely, you see. And then I'm moving on. And what I'm going to do now is to show you how, having done something that's not really entirely functional, we're going to do something that's very functional next. And I am going to use a sort of secondary dominant idea by going from C7 to an F major chord. So really I'm going five, seven in second inversion to one in F. So do you see how we've got to that point? Because in a way you can't really key reference it, but you know, if we're gonna sort of start with a sense of C major and then somewhere at the midpoint, we're using a chord that happens to be a primary chord in C major, it sort of locates some sense of overall key although you can't very much capture that with a chromatic scale. So if we take what we've got so far up to this chord of F, we've got this. So you can hear suddenly that five, seven second inversion to one in F feels, oh, right, we've gone home somewhere. There's something a bit functional happening, which is quite nice after the previous movement. The previous movement, however, I think works fairly well, mainly because of this contrary motion going on at the top. Also looking for common notes. You notice two G's in the alto there, two E's there. We talked about this two F sharps, two C's thing. Look at how many C's I've managed to tuck into the tenor part. So we get common notes going there. It's all going to help the part writing. And looking at the alto part, you know, two Gs, two F sharps, and then we've got a couple of A's there, a couple of B's there, you know, so some stability is really useful. And then look at all these F's in the tenor. So particularly using your middle parts to kind of stabilize when you've got something that's actually quite volatile harmonically is a good idea. Okay, so we got as far as F major. So where are we gonna go next? Well, going on to F sharp, I mean, having gone from, you know, a five, seven to a one in F, you might say, well, why don't I do the same again? Five, seven to one in G, five, seven to one in A. Well, you can do that. Absolutely perfectly possible to do that. I'm just thinking of different possibilities that can be a bit colorful. So this idea of going five, seven, one, five, seven, one is an easy way of dealing with a chromatic scale or easier maybe. Um, but sometimes you want something more colorful, don't you? And it's a good way to explore harmony, chromatic harmony in a different kind of context where maybe not everything has to function entirely as it often does. Right, so there's the F major chord. What am I gonna do next? I'm gonna use another diminished seventh. So this is the F major chord. And then when the scale moves on to F sharp, you can hear what I'm doing now, another diminished seventh. So, okay, we've got that kind of steady movement, common notes in the middle, and just the outer parts moving out. Somebody's gonna say, oh, hang on a minute, you've got false relations. That is true. I've got an F natural down here, followed by an F sharp up there. But to be honest, when you're dealing with a chromatic scale, it's very difficult to avoid false relations. And because it's in the context of a chromatic scale, it's somehow less disturbing on the ear. So you don't have to worry about that quite so much here. So we've got the F major chord. We've got another diminished seventh. Then I'm gonna use a G7 chord. So that's what this chord is about. That's just a G7, a dominant seventh in the key of C, if you like, in its second inversion. And again, just as that previous dominant seventh we used, you know, you might think, well, it should be resolving to a chord one in C. It can't do that because I've got a G sharp in the melody. But what I'm gonna do is the little trick we did before. So you just get used to this idea of a dominant seventh followed by an augmented sixth chord. So now I'm using a, a German six. So again, you see how that functions really nicely. G seven 
German 6. Okay, see how that works? Now, if you're key referencing this German 6, you have to key reference it to the key of F because it's built on this D flat, which is the lowered sixth degree of the scale of F major, or it is the sixth degree of the scale of F minor. Well, we're going on to a chord of F major. So this progresses quite nicely to use a German six in the key of F before the A in the melody, so that we go on to that F major chord quite happily. When we get to the F major chord, some of you have been thinking, oh, hang on a minute, that's in second inversion. I thought we had to be a bit careful about second inversions. Normally, absolutely, you do. Again, once you're in this chromatic scale framework, it's funny how things like that become less of an issue. You know, having had a G sharp, if we go to A, well, you might be thinking normally it would do that. You know, six would go to five, four would go to three. Sounds quite nice if you want to write something like that. So if you had a passage that did that, well, here's one way of harmonizing it if you're doing something more romantic in style. However, we could go on to that and then because we're being chromatic, we can go somewhere else. Okay, now I'm gonna just sort of illustrate something a little bit different here. This time, I'm gonna use a G diminished chord, not a diminished seventh, a G diminished, so that's G, B flat, D flat, and we're gonna add a seventh to that G diminished chord. That's not a diminished seventh because a diminished seventh would be that, but it's an F natural, so so G diminished with a seventh added to it. So we're gonna go from this F major chord to this. Now, in a way, you can look at that chord and say, well, really, that's a chord 2-7 in F minor. So if you've just been in F major or on a chord of F major, well, then this is a borrowed chord from the parallel minor. It's a 2-7 from F minor. One way of looking at how that vaguely functions. And then just as we're coming into the final run, I'm going to use an Italian 6. I mean, these augmented six chords are pretty interchangeable, whether you use an Italian, a French, or a German six. And if you're not sure about those, well, we've covered that elsewhere. So um, have a look around um, and see if you can find the stuff we've done on that. Um, but here's an Italian six, just because we used Germans before. So there's an Italian six on the penultimate note. And then that very nicely resolves onto a C major chord. And I do think because you're going to have that C major chord at the end, if you have a chord before it that, that does function a bit more strongly onto it, it makes the whole thing feel a little bit more kind of settled in some sense of, there's some sense of cadence about it anyway. You see the point I'm making though here is that there are lots of different ways of doing this. Lots of people just think harmonizing a chromatic scale is impossible because you can't find enough diatonic chords. You have to use some chromatic chords. You have to have a little bit of sense of how to use some chords in a less functional way. But actually you've got a lot of options. So if you're worried about it, well, just go a whole series of five ones. Five one. Five one, you know, and, and keep going up doing five ones. You can do that stuff. But if you're wanting to do something a bit more colourful, you can kind of mix and match a bit in the way that we've described. So what do we end up with in this particular harmonization of a chromatic scale? We end up with this. Okay, well, I hope you like the impact of that to deliver the whole chromatic scale with that harmony, but it certainly puts you into a sort of later 19th century kind of framework, doesn't it? So apart from being able to harmonize the whole chromatic scale, I'm hoping that this might be a useful resource. So if you just want to do something like, you know, a passage of harmony that involves those three notes of the chromatic scale, you can just think, well, I could do this works perfectly well, doesn't it? So you can kind of lift corners out of this and use them as the basis for writing any kind of harmony 
in a chromatic context. But if you want to harmonize the whole chromatic scale, well, there's one way of doing it. Well, if you found this video helpful, uh, let me invite you to take a little trip to the Music Matters website, www.mmcourses.co.uk. And when you get there, you might like to click on our courses. And if you're really wanting to investigate more of this kind of chromatic harmony, well, the advanced theory course might be for you. If you think you've got a decent kind of theory knowledge as a basis and you just want to develop it further, have a look at the advanced course. You might want to look at the Bach Chorale course if you're kind of looking at something a little bit more traditional than this. Or you might be thinking, well, this is all very well, but what I need to do is to get all this harmony under my fingers. In which case, have a look at our keyboard harmony course. Lots of other courses there, lots of other exciting things on the website. Have a look, see what you can find that would be of use to you. www.mmcourses.co.uk